Welcome everyone to today's session on tips to designing 3D printed parts like a pro. My name is Kanan Irons. I'm a 3D printing application engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. And today we're going to be covering DFAM or design for additive manufacturing. And more and more it's becoming important for engineers and designers to have a good understanding of DFAM concepts and practices. And, and good DFAM goes beyond simply printing your existing design successfully. It, it involves taking it to the next level and changing your design for a specific additive technology or an additive process, even down to the machine. And so when you do that, you can improve performance, you can reduce costs and improve productivity. And so that's what we're gonna show you today. And before we get started, uh, let's take a little bit uh, and look at a little bit about myself. As an application engineer, I specialize in education on additive technologies as well as training. And so I'm using this type of equipment on a day-to-day -day basis. And part of my job is to help customers justify equipment for purchase. And a big part of that is DFAM. And part of that process can be printing sample parts, running cost analysis, looking at facility layouts, but a big part of that is justifying the equipment for purchase to make sure whatever project makes sense. And here at Hawkridge, we specialize in Mark Forge and HP 3D, system, uh, 3D printing systems. And these cover both prototyping all the way to full-blown production. And so we work with customers that are one-man shops all the way to large organizations that are producing products that you use every day. Also, my background's in mechanical engineering. I've worked in wind energy, aerospace, consumer electronics, and in a machine shop environment. And, and part of that was um, additive was a big part of that process for me as, a, as an ME. Originally from Abilene, Texas, and now I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, a very beautiful place. And today I am streaming in from our San Jose Digital Manufacturing Lab. And here we house all of our additive equipment and we operate it. And so um, with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda for today. And so we're gonna take a look at the three most common additive technologies on the market. And, and then also gonna look at a workflow a good map or workflow for doing a DFAM process. We're gonna look at common materials that are used in additive manufacturing, both plastics and metals. Uh, and then we're gonna take a look at some of those tips specific to technologies, those tips that you can immediately implement into your current design process, your current projects. And then towards the end, we're gonna look at metal systems and full color systems, both very exciting topics. And so we'll be able to touch on both of those. And then at the end, we'll have a, an open Q&A. And so as we go through this, feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A tab and also feel free to use the chat. I know that several Hawk Ridge team members will be on standby in the chat and can also assist there. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. And, and the first thing that we want to look at when going over DFAM is how are 3D printers being used today? What we see is three primary areas, prototyping, manufacturing aids, and in-use parts. And, and most folks will be familiar with the prototyping use cases. We're talking about design, fit and function, testing. Uh, but one trend that we see for large organizations is this concept of mass prototyping, where these large companies have such a high demand for printed parts that they create their own internal service bureau to field all those requests. And so that's one area that we see with mass prototyping. And then on manufacturing aids, this, this category or sector is, is growing every day. Uh, we see it with assembly jigs, uh, fixtures, no-go gauges, anything that you can use to assist or aid in the manufacturing process. I'm amazed that when I walk down an assembly line at all the areas where an additive process can help uh, improve efficiencies, reduce costs, reduce downtime. And so that is a, a certainly a big area for additive parts. And then we have end-use parts. So we're looking, uh, one area is low to mid-volume production, where folks used to injection mold for those types of quantities. Now it can make sense with an additive process. Uh, the, the technology has advanced and the, the part costs 
has, has come down far enough where it can compete with injection molding for low to mid volume production. Then we also see it with customized products. Uh, orthotic insoles would be a, an excellent example of that. Uh, it's any time that you have a need for high quantities of unique items. And then finally, bridge the tooling. So maybe the, the end goal is injection molding, but you can't justify the tooling for the, the introductory quantities that you're looking at. And so an additive process can be used to bridge that gap. And so we're seeing these additive parts being used in all these areas. And it's important to have that understanding as you go in and as you start to design parts for specific technologies. The next thing we want to look at is the, the additive big three. And so we have material extrusion, resin-based or UV curable, and then powder-based. And so I've split these up based on their raw material form. Uh, and, and within each one of these, you'll, I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of them. For instance, material extrusion, we have FDM, fused deposition modeling, or fused filament fabrication. Uh, but there's even metals even on material extrusion. But essentially, it's the process of extruding material out of a nozzle, building up your parts layer by layer. And then on resin base, uh, you'd probably be most familiar with an SLA process where the, the raw material is in a liquid vat and it's cured using lights or lasers. Uh, but in that, even in that category, we have full color, we have multi-materials, and then we have powder base. And so multi-jet fusion is gonna be one of the most common powder base systems out there, and also SLS or selective laser sintering. And so, um, this category also has metals available as well. And so it can be confusing as you see all these different types of machines, manufacturers, but I find it's very simple to divide them based on raw material. And then we can start to look at the strengths or advantages uh, between each because each one of them has their place. When we look at a comparison chart, I, I put this together uh, just to give an idea of how these technologies perform in specific attributes. And while I, I will admit there are outliers within each one of these, it, it's just a good baseline for you to go as you start to, to prepare for your additive project. Uh, the first thing, looking at production speed, uh, a powder-based system is going to be above and beyond anything else when it comes to producing high quantities of parts. And one of the big reasons that can happen is because you can nest parts on top of each other, inside each other to fully utilize that build volume and these printers can print complete layers in single passes. And so that's one reason that your production speed, you wanna immediately start looking at a powder base. When it comes to part strength, all three have pretty good materials out available. Uh, but one, for instance, material extrusion, uh, with the Mark IV machines that we offer, they have a process called CFF, or continuous filament fabrication. And with the ability to embed fibers into your plastic part, now you're starting to reach metal-like strength uh, using a plastic or a composite part. Then when it comes to cosmetic finish, typically your resin-based systems are gonna have the best, smoothest finish available, uh, but powder-based uh, systems are no slouch in that department either. And really any technology can be brought to very smooth surface finishes through post-processing like chemical polishing or vapor smoothing. Then when we come to fine details, uh, again, the UV or resin-based systems are going to be very good, but the powder-based systems also can do incredibly fine details. We're talking thin walls, we're talking really fine features, and then material extrusion tends not to do as well in, in those areas. And then when we look at ease to bring in-house, let's say uh, you're someone that wants to pick up an additive technology and you're just getting started, material extrusion is going to be a, a, a really good bet because typically they'll fit on your desktop, plug into a 110 outlet, and they're, they're very easy to learn how to use and, and, and to maintain. And then I bring up part costs, and a question that I get quite a bit is, is there any of them that have better part costs? Uh, well, a lot of that will depend on the material because each one of these has low-cost materials and more expensive, high-performance type materials. Uh, and then it also depends on your quantity of production. So I, I do that just as a talking point. And then we have ease to design for. So now if you've ever gone to a service bureau, you'll likely see that a, a lot of the parts that they produce are using powder-based systems. Uh, one reason is because they can keep up with that high quantity demand, but also they're very easy to design for. Uh, in other words, several orientations can be very successful 
and typically there's very few changes that need to be made to an existing part file. And then the last thing I want to show you there is unique materials. And so your extrusion-based technologies can do well with continuous fibers, uh, metals, resin-based, they have transparent materials available in full color. And then on powder-based systems, they have also full color and metals. And so looking at this chart, that's a great way just to get a, a broad understanding of, of the strengths and weaknesses of each technology. And the next thing that we need to look at are materials available. And so you may have seen a, a pyramid like this before, but what it is, it, it separates materials by standard plastics, engineering, and high performance. And each one of the technologies dabbles in, in these different sections. But for instance, on standard plastics, uh, you'd be probably familiar with ABS, PLA, or polypropylene. And then moving up to engineering plastics, anytime you move up, you're going to move up on performance, uh, typically temperature resistance or heat deflection temperatures, for instance, uh, and then also your cost. And so engineering plastics is very common to add it would be nylon or polyamide. But there's also elastomers, TPUs, TPAs. And then at the top of the pyramid, we have very high performance materials that can withstand high temperatures, very strong, such as Ultim or Peak. And so this gives you a good understanding of, of typical materials that we see out there. I also want to show you metals, and I have, I've divided them roughly in the same format, but uh, on metal side, stainless steel is going to be very common. But then we have higher performance type materials such as titanium and econel. Uh, we have conductive materials available such as copper uh, and then also aluminum. And so more and more of these materials are coming out. And typically, if a, a material can be metal injection molded, uh, there's a good chance it can be 3D printed as well. Now, the next thing we want to look at is a general workflow for DFAM. So as we're designing parts to be printed, uh, the first two steps are going to be pretty similar for any design process, uh, but first we need to understand the design constraints. Uh, what are my accuracy requirements? What are my temperatures? What is the environment or the loads that this part's going to be subjected to? And pretty quickly you will understand, let's say you have high accuracy requirements and the technology that you're looking at doesn't quite meet that, then you'll know that post-processing is required. Maybe skim passes with machines or reaming out holes for high accuracy would be required. And then we identify materials uh, using those charts as a, a good baseline uh, based on the application. And, and typically, uh, you're looking to reduce costs, and so you want to start as low as you can on the pyramid and uh, only go up when the application demands it. And then we have cosmetic constraints. This one may be a little more specific to an additive process. Uh, one of the things you need to look at is the surface finish. Uh, maybe that's the roughness average. How smooth is the part? And so if you have high requirements for smoothness, you will either need to go with a resin system or you need to look at post-processing, that chemical polishing or a tumbling, mechanical polishing. And then when you set your production goals, that's going to pretty quickly narrow down the field, especially if you have high quantities, for instance, that would push you towards a powder-based system. And then at that point, you're about ready to identify an additive technology. And so once you've done that, you've identified a technology, maybe it's a machine, uh, you need to understand the, the build volume of that machine and also the design guide. Uh, what are the minimum feature sizes, minimum wall thicknesses, how big of a part can I print, how, how thick can I print? And these are all things that are good to have a solid understanding of any time that you're, you're doing an additive project. And then at the end, all additive technologies will have some sort of post-processing and so you need to plan for that going in. You need to look at the, the human labor required to, to have a part in hand, uh, because oftentimes after a part has been printed, there's still post-processing that's required. Now, depending on if you have uh, the additive equipment in-house or if you outsource to a service bureau, uh, you would typically slice the file, you would nest it, select your print orientation, and then send to print. And so this is a good general workflow to consider as you start a, an additive project. And then more specifically, there are considerations that are, are good to think about uh, between each technology category that we have here. Uh, one of the main things is going to be support structures because support structures can alter the way that you design that part. Uh, with powder-based systems, you don't have support structures. And so that does open up some design possibilities, especially for internal features. 
Uh, but on the flip side, you have to look at how powder will be removed from that part once it's been printed. And then we look at strength properties. Are my strength properties isotropic, meaning are they the same strength in each axis? Uh, for material extrusion, uh, they're typically stronger in the XY plane, and so that's going to change how you design the part, how you orient it for print. Whereas the other two technologies are near or isotropic, very close to or isotropic, the same strength in each direction. And then maybe you want to look at layer heights. Uh, and typically your resin-based systems and your powder-based systems are going to do a little bit better on, on layer heights on average. And then build volume. One of the things that can be the most impactful as you design for a, a particular technology is understanding the build volume and either splitting your design to fit that or shortening the design so that you could fit more in a single run. So that's going to be one of the key strategies that we take a look at. And typically your material extrusions have very large volumes at the high end and they can accept some of those large part designs that are required. When we look at print orientation, and we kind of touched on that on the, the last chart with ease to design for, uh, but powder base is not, not as important typically compared to the other two. Uh, quantity of parts, we already looked at that. Powder does really good with high volume. And then on post-processing, uh, when we talked about planning for post-processing uh, with material extrusion, you're typically going to remove the supports. And that could be anywhere from, it could be the same material. Let's say you're printing with a plastic, it could be the same plastic, or it could be something that can be dissolved in a, a solution. Uh, on resin-based systems, you have a similar, uh, similar goal as far as uh, maybe you need to remove supports through an IPA wash or, or a UV post-cure. And then on your powder-based systems, uh, you'll be looking at depowdering or a bead blast. And so it's important to understand that going in as you design parts. And the last thing there is infill structure or, or solid. Uh, you, typically, your material extrusions will do an infill structure that's mostly hollow, and so that's going to speed up your print time and lower your part cost. Uh, but in these cases, also solid is typically an option, whereas the other two technologies are true to CAD. So if you print a part that's mostly hollow, it will come out hollow. Uh, if you print it solid, it will be solid. And so with that in mind, now let's take a look at specific tips for each one of these technologies. And this is where it really gets exciting. And so uh, starting off with material extrusion, uh, you'll see the, the video on the right hand side of the, the Mark Forge Metal X. And again, this is material being extruded out of a nozzle. And, and most often the, the raw material is spooled. And so uh, that also means that it's very easy to change materials typically when you're working with uh, this type of machine. Uh, but we're going to consider support structures, infill structures, uh, print orientation, and, and really optimizing for those strength properties as well as look at layer heights and continuous fibers would be the last thing that I'd like to show you there. Uh, but starting off with your support structures, typically you want to have your cosmetic surfaces facing upwards. Uh, and the reason being because anytime you have support structures, which here's a picture of, of some there, uh, it, typically those surfaces that interface the support in your part don't have as good of a surface finish. And so in general, it's good to face those cosmetic surfaces upwards. Uh, the next thing, uh, which is a good tip, is to eliminate supports if possible. And the way that you do that can be seen in the bottom left-hand corner here. And so if you're able to implement chamfers or teardrop-shaped channels and holes, that can oftentimes completely eliminate the need for supports. And oftentimes with these types of systems, uh, you usually have about a 45-degree minimum uh, unsupported overhang angle. And so you can do some really neat stuff. And I'll show you an example in a second of, of really taking advantage of that uh, attribute. And when you're able to do that to eliminate support structures, it's typically going to improve the cosmetic finish on those surfaces that were before interfaced with support. It's going to eliminate that post-processing time. So as soon as that print's done, you're able to take it off and immediately use it. And then oftentimes it can reduce print time and reduce the overall cost for your part. The last thing on, on this would be to plan for support removal and the accessibility of that support. Because uh, we've seen some parts that have maybe ducts or channels that take turns uh, that can be difficult to remove supports. And so you need to keep that in mind as you design your parts. Is that support accessible so that I could remove it at the end? I want to show you a, an example of a part that we've designed here. 
uh, and this is a nozzle and that nozzle has a single inlet on top and it has eight outlets and so it's it's, it's a, a manifold uh, and inside that nozzle we see there's a cone and in that cone there are cooling channels that that run along the contour of that cone and so almost no support was required to print this part out of metal and anything from the, the chamfers on the edges all the way to even the logo having chamfered on upward facing edge chamfers on upward facing edges uh, and teardrop shaped holes and, and channels that conform to those rules that 45 degree angle that was all applied in the design of this part and so you could see that this would be almost impossible to make any other way and the only support on this part was a little plug at the top where that round shaped hole was for a fitting and so this is just one example but there are all sorts of ways that you can take advantage of, of this unsupported overhang for complex internal features and, and that's the way to take it a little bit further when you're working with this type of technology the next things that were typically considered with uh, material extrusion will be your infill structures uh, oftentimes you'll see a triangular infill structure like you see here on a cross section of a part uh, but things to consider with this would be wall layers how thick are your walls uh, and whether or not you're going to be removing material because if you're going to be doing a machining pass or reaming out holds you want to make sure and thicken those walls up as you start to slice your part and uh, densities and structures themselves can be changed to different geometries uh, and you can have your part more and more solid until it's completely solid uh, but usually there's a diminishing return especially on large parts uh, so usually printing with a mostly hollow structure is advised on, on machines like this. Next thing we want to look at is going to be print orientation and strength properties. And so parts on extrusion based systems typically are anisotropic, meaning that they're weaker in a certain axis and that's typically the Z axis. And so um, in the example here, we have an X, Y sample versus a Z sample. And you would expect that the XY sample would have a little bit per better performance on a tensile test along the length of the part. There are some trade-offs though, uh, because extrusion-based systems are typically a little more accurate in the X and the Y plane. And so you have to balance that cosmetic finish, that accuracy versus strength for your parts. A good rule of thumb is to aim for the highest amount of surface area touching the build platform. And that usually reduces the need for, for most of the support that would be required in other orientations. But these uh, properties can be overcome through clever splitting of parts, uh, reinforcing your parts in certain ways. Uh, and so these things can be overcome, but it's important to know that going in. The next thing we need to look at are layer heights. And this is really, it can be extended to each technology, both resin and powder-based systems. Uh, but you're really looking for cosmetic finish and this artifact called stair-stepping. And so thicker layer heights tend to show more stair stepping than finer le resolution layer heights. And these can also influence dimensional accuracy in the Z direction. And so it's usually a trade off depending on print speed and layer height as to which would be the best for your particular application. Uh, for our Mark, Mark Ford systems, we typically want run at 100 microns. We can go down to 50 or even up over 200. Uh, but that we found that that has been a great balance of excellent cosmetic finish uh, and the print time is not too bad on it. And now the, the last thing I want to show you on material extrusion would be fiber reinforcement. And so this is a, a process developed by Mark Ford's called CFF or continuous filament fabrication, but it involves the embedding of continuous fibers into a plastic part for specific layers. And so when you're able to do that, you can really improve the strength, uh, even match aluminum in certain cases. And there's flexibility with the, with the fiber layout software called Iger. Uh, it will allow you to actually orient fibers in specific directions. And so you can fine tune your part design uh, with directional fibers that are, let's say they're in the direction of a tensile load. Uh, and you can really maximize the performance of your part and it's really incredible to think about that because you're talking about a, a machine that's sitting on your desk and now you're producing parts that are incredibly strong. Next thing we want to look at now are powder based systems and, and this is perhaps my favorite type of technology. This is the one that I use the most often uh, and there's some really good tips that I'm going to give you regarding packing and nesting of parts. 
powder removal, and also hollowing strategies to reduce cost. And typically the way powder systems work uh, is that you have raw material that's spread out using a roller. And in the case of this video, we see HP multi-jet fusion where a print head will sweep across and disperse agents or inks. And notice how the parts can be stacked on each other. They can be nested together and so you can see very quickly that this is a, a very fast process. And so it's aimed at higher quantities of parts. And the first thing we wanna look at are gonna be nesting strategies. Uh, and nesting is so important when it comes to improving the efficiency of your machine. Uh, and designing your parts to effectively nest is gonna be one of the biggest tips I can give you when you're working with one of these systems. Uh, I have two examples here. Uh, one on the left side, we have a box. Uh, and, and in this particular build, we could fit 18 boxes, but notice that the internal area of the box is mostly empty. So that's a lot of wasted space. And when you're able to do some DFAM and split up that box into individual panels, you go from doing 18 to 54 full assemblies for the same print time. And, and this is with NJF, and, and one of the uh, attributes of NJF is that you're gonna have the same print time and the only thing that will determine your print time is the maximum build height. And so right away, you can do a, a significant improvement on your production. And this will come down to part cost too. Your part cost is going to be significantly cheaper. Uh, I have folks all the time that will send me part files that um, the other thing that we look at is to ensure that they fit properly in the build volume. Uh, for instance, if you had a really long part file that could only fit diagonally in the build volume, you wouldn't be able to fit near as many as if you made it a little bit shorter to fit one edge. Uh, this, this machine in particular has a 15 inch by 11.2 by 15 inch build volume. And so being able to, to work with those machine build volumes and fully understand that uh, can be key in becoming more efficient. The next thing to consider is going to be your powder removal. Once you've printed that part, how are, you, are we going to finish off the part and remove any powder from internal channels. Uh, what I've shown here is a video of me cleaning out a, a skull example that has several internal chambers and channels. And part of the DFAM for a powder-based machine is to ensure that this step is seamless, to ensure that it's as easy and as quick as possible. Because what that does is it sets you up for automation as you scale into production. Uh, automated systems, uh, we actually offer some from AMT that are automated bead blasters, those do really well if you have parts that have smoother surfaces, uh, they have open, uh, open areas that are easy to access. And so those are the things that you want to consider when you're looking at powder removal. A little tip on the, the right hand side of the screen uh, can do with ducts. So anytime you have ducts that are long that may make some turns, these can be very difficult to bead blast. And so one of the tips is to model in a chain that follows the contour of that duct that will be pulled out uh, after the part has been printed. Uh, because often with bead blast, you just need a little bit of a hole so that that media can start moving through the part. And that's really all it takes to get it started. And so that's one of our tips. And the next one is to limit the amount of really deep blind holes or pockets. Uh, at the bottom hand, uh, right hand side of the screen, you can see small holes that are very deep those are difficult to bead blast and they take a manual process to clean them out. And so one of our tips is to make those through holes or if you can, uh, increase the diameter of holes to make it a little bit easier to bead blast. And so those are some good tactics on the, the post-processing side for powder-based systems. Next thing we wanna show you are going to be hollowing strategies. And so hollowing could be uh, the use of internal structures like honeycombs, it can be lattice structures, uh, and then also part of hollowing is essentially we're talking about removing as much material as you can. Uh, maybe that's through top topology optimization. You get an organic part that is very efficient on material. But when you do that, uh, it's going to reduce the overall packing density of a build. And what packing density is, is the ratio of part geometry to empty space for a given build volume. <laughs> and typically powder-based systems have a sweet spot for that. Uh, packing density. For multi-jet fusion, it's usually between 8 and 12 percent. 
And so let's say you had a solid cube that you decided to hollow. When you hollow it, it's going to use less agents or less ink. So that's going to bring your part cost down. It's going to reduce that packing density. And so what that enables you to do is to fit more parts in a single build. So it can be pretty incredible how much lower your part cost is and how many more parts you can fit in a single build just because you did a lattice structure, maybe on the inside of your part. Uh, and one thing to consider when you do hollow is, is that you expect the powder to be trapped in the part unless you provide escape holes or you do an open face like we see with the middle example. Uh, and that happens all the time. And, and really it still is quite a bit cheaper if you still hollow it, even though that you know you're trapping powder. Uh, but just keep that in mind as you start to design parts. And so the next thing we want to <clears throat> look at is going to look at the resin-based systems. And so resin-based systems, they usually typically have a liquid material that's cured by UV light or a laser. And notice how the on the video here, we have the build platform upside down, and it's being pulled upwards as the part is being formed. And so as you can see, this part does have support structures that we'll need to consider. Uh, and so let's get in, start off with print orientation. One tip for print orientation on these types of systems is to limit the amount of uh, cups that are facing towards the liquid uh, or flat surfaces. Uh, what happens is when the bill platform is being pulled up, it can cause suction or a hydrostatic pressure on the side walls of your parts, and that could cause them to fail as they're being built up. <clears throat> so typically what you want to do is either angle a flat surface so that that pressure or that vacuum is not as high uh, or orient your, your cup or dome shaped surfaces where the open end is facing the build platform. So that's just a quick tip that, that we have for resin based systems. Next thing you want to look at is support structures. So planning again for that removal of support structures is very important. Uh, and ensuring that your cosmetic surfaces, again, are facing upwards is generally good practice for these types of systems. And uh, you can eliminate supports in certain examples very similar to, to what we looked at with extrusion-based systems. And so you need to plan for that, essentially. Plan for that, support removal, accessibility. Next, we want to look at hollowing. So hollowing is a, a very preferred strategy for resin-based systems uh, to reduce print time, to re reduce the amount of material that's used. Uh, but when you do that, you want to make sure you have a surface that would be good for drainage because you need to drain that liquid resin out of the internal areas of that part. And so those drainage holes should typically be as low as possible. And so I only have a few tips on resin-based systems. And one reason is because there's, there's so many different types out there and they do all have more unique strategies that are required. And so this is more of just a, a basic overview for resin. Next thing we want to look at are metal. So metal is an exciting uh, area of additive manufacturing. Uh, and the two primary solutions out on the market are going to be material extrusion-based systems or powder-based systems. Uh, I have an extrusion-based system here in my lab. Uh, it's from Mark Forge called the Metal X. And with these systems, most of your FDM rules or your extrusion based rules are going to apply. And so that means overhangs. So if you have 45 degrees, you can eliminate the need for support structures. Uh, you want your cosmetic surfaces facing upwards. Uh, with these systems, it's very easy to actually change materials, swap them out. And they typically have low facility requirements and low safety equipment requirements. So you, you don't need to have any breathers on. And the printer portion itself is typically desktop, around a desktop size. It's office friendly. Uh, with these, the raw material is typically a metal powder mixed with a wax binder. And so the, the other steps that would be required with these types of systems are going to be uh, washing the part to wash and remove that wax binder. And finally, center. So those are other pieces of equipment to consider. And the center is an oven that will fuse and fuse those layers together at the, near the melting point or at the melting point of the raw material. And one of the strategies that's more specific to metal uh, for an extrusion base is how you deal with those supports. Because anytime you have supports with an extrusion based metal process, you need to look at how that's going to be removed because it is the same material as the, the metal itself. So, for instance, if we're printing with a, an ink canal, we're going to have ink and L supports that need to be removed. And this can be tricky anytime you have internal channels or internal features that can catch those supports and make them difficult. 
And so what March Forge has done for their, their solution is to split up those supports using ceramic layers. And so those ceramic layers make it very easy to remove supports and break them up. And, and what we see in this image here is a cross section of the part with the purple supports on the outside. And what they've done is split them up so they could be easy to remove from each side. Uh, you can also split up your supports into individual cubes that can uh, essentially pour out of the inside of a part unless you had a, a big open chamber on the inside. And so those are some of the strategies to think about as you design for a, a metal extrusion base machine. And again, these are typically really easy to, to learn how to use uh, and they're very easy to install typically. Then we have powder-based systems. And so the benefits of powder-based systems are going to be high details, higher part accuracy, and they, they do also have good material selection as well, uh, depending on which one you have. So there's two of the most common are going to be your DMLS or direct metal laser centering or your binder jetting. And so those are the two most common that we see. Uh, DMLS typically requires support and part of your design is figuring out how you're going to remove that support. And oftentimes it requires the use of other equipment such as EDM lasers to cut the part off of the base and to remove the part from its supports. Uh, but you do have the benefit of, of very accurate parts that can do those high details. And, and we're seeing a lot of parts uh, from metal systems being used in other industries such as aerospace because we can produce very lightweight parts that are optimized specifically for that application. And so these systems are really opening up new opportunities for design and, and they're, they're starting to change industries and then make things more uh, increased performance on products that we see. Next one's going to be binder jetting. So binder jetting typically does have a, a, a wax that's mixed in uh, and also a center step. And so with these, they are more suited for higher volume production. As you can see from this image here, they typically, they're very similar to MJF in the fact that they spread out powder on a layer and then they uh, have a binder that will connect the part together before it's ready to be fused in the center. And these also have good material selection. Uh, but they don't require support. And so that is a, a big advantage for binder jetting, not having support requirements. So these typically have higher production capability. Uh, both DMLS and binder jetting have uh, normally higher hardware investment costs. They have higher safety requirements. Typically you need to have a breather, at least a ventilation uh, breather that you wear. And so there are more constraints, but they do have some really great advantages. The next thing that we want to show you is, are going to be color-based systems. And so the two most common color-based systems that we see out there are resin-based color systems or powder-based color systems. And these can do full CMYK. And so whatever color you have on your CAD, you can print it out. Uh, the advantages of a, a UV curable system will be that they can do transparent materials. Uh, they also typically have a smoother surface finish. They can do softer materials. And they do have higher color accuracy on average. They do typically have pretty good colors uh, right off the machine. Uh, we, we see these using being heavily in the medical industry for hospitals. And we really see that with the powder base too, because we, we actually sell HP multi-jet fusion uh, color-based system uh, to hospitals. And so both of them have their unique niche and they have their benefits. And so, the benefit being of the, the powder-based system is that typically your parts are going to be stronger. Uh, they're typically a lot faster on production, so you could produce uh, quite a few more in a, in a day, for instance. And they're typically a lot lower on the part costs. And so you see those trade-offs. Uh, and and color-based systems can also be chemically polished to get you a very, very good finish, very smooth, and, and that really helps the colors pop. Uh, again, going back to the, the UV curable side, uh, those soft materials, uh, surgeons are using those to practice surgeries before they go in. Uh, we see anatomical models for both powder-based and UV curable, but they all have their, their different uses in, within a, a hospital, for instance. Uh, some tips for you specifically for color is to uh, normally do this in the CAD. So if you have a CAD software such as SolidWorks, uh, you want to add the color to the surfaces of your part. And then e exporting correctly is going to be key. Uh, typically, we see 3MF as the primary file format for exporting out of a program like SOLIDWORKS, but also VRML is another format that will work, and OBJ are going to be your typical formats. And so ensuring that you do the work properly in the CAD side to 
attach those colors to surfaces is going to be key anytime you look at a, a color printing system. And then to make colors pop, one thing that we've seen is that if you can do small color patches or patterns on the surface of the part, they always look more impressive than without, than for instance, going with a solid color. Uh, another trick there is to look at the, the raw material color itself. For instance, on MJF, the raw material color is white. And so if you make the main body of your color, your part white, and then you add little color, maybe you have a logo or a graphic that you want to put on the part, that's usually going to be a good bet. And it can also slightly reduce the part costs anytime you're looking at color. I would like to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar today. And uh, if you want to follow up, you can see my email at the bottom side of the screen. And uh, be sure to keep an eye out for any future Hawk Ridge webinars. With that, I'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks.